Welcome, everybody. Hey, guys. So as I as I told Anna <laughs> just a minute ago, I'm um, having some camera issues. I was having camera issues yesterday in class. Um, <laughs> right now, you're just staring at Ripley, but it's really me. Uh, so yeah, so welcome, everyone. I'm sure some folks will periodically uh, filter in. The waiting room has been disabled, so we look forward to those of you planning to show up for this chat and process over you with uh, Hannah Lee, illustrator extraordinaire. We've got uh, Stewart's Creek in the house. Hey, Tucker. So glad that you could join us, my friend. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, Stewart's Creek is a pretty awesome uh, high school that I've come to learn of uh, through some colleagues and also just the uh, Instagram handle that they have. And it's definitely a school that I'm, I'm, I'm wanting my son to go to because it seems awesome. Um, so for those of you listening, uh, Tucker has put together a podcast. What's that podcast called, Tucker? Uh, it's just SCHS Visual Art Podcast. Okay, definitely check it out. I mean, somehow Tucker has managed to get folks like Julia Rothman, illustrator extraordinaire, and Jessica Hish, one of my favorite uh, type designers, to visit with his high school classes, and it's insane. So. I'm totally in love with both of those human beings. The first time I noticed uh, Jessica Hish was through a, uh, <clears throat> a Wes Anderson movie called Moonrise Kingdom. And apparently she did the type for that film and it was gorgeous. I also saw her speak in Philly and she showed this idea that she had for a tabletop game about divorce. Did she talk about that with y'all, Tucker? I'm sorry. I, I heard you talking about the Wes yeah, Anderson, and we were trying. Tabletop game that she was. Using. She didn't talk about the tabletop game. Oh, game. it's so no, cool. She did it's... talk about Wes Anderson though. Well, yeah, I think that I mean both are really cool. The tabletop game was really interesting. I'm not sure if she actually brought it to fruition, but it was a game for kids to learn how to cope with divorce, like their parents divorcing. If I'm remembering it right, it's a really fun idea. So uh, before we get started. In, uh, in illustration news, for those of you who are, are, aren't aware or are aware, Bill Meyer recently picked up the Hamilton King Award recently, and that is the highest honor that can be bestowed on an illustrator via the uh, Society of Illustrators in New York and beyond well-deserved, right? I mean, his work is just beyond incredible. Um, have you ever met Bill and his wife, uh, Lee, Hannah? Yeah, yeah. I've been working with them as an intern for three or two, four months. Oh, that was fun. So are you yeah. talking about, this is recent? Oh, no, no. It's like a couple of years ago. Oh, he's so amazing. I met him. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I met him in Decatur uh, for work. I was actually asked to attend uh, like an early dinner at a place called the Iberian Pig. And it was yeah. kind of like a, a tradition to take out the alumni mentor to dinner after they lectured and demoed to the students. And at that time, Goni Montez, a mm -hmm. phenomenal illustrator and educator. For those of you listening, Goni is someone to look at. He's actually got a new piece in Rolling Stone that just came out about, I don't know, a couple days ago. Um, I think it was about the Foo Fighters, like a new record for Foo Fighters. Um, and yeah, so at the dinner, my eyes were just so focused on Goni's like powerful presence because that dude is like really powerful. I didn't realize that for the first 10 minutes, I was actually sitting next to Bill freaking Meyer, you know, and I lost my mind, you know, and Lee was right next to him. And I looked at him and I was like, I learned about you in school, man. And it was such a great evening. So yes, mega congrats to Bill. So welcome, Hannah. How are you today? Where are you living these Thank days? Thank you. I'm living in Roosevelt Island, which is a little island in between Manhattan and Queens. And I've just been staying at home for like the past year. But I, I work at home anyway, so I don't feel like much difference in my life. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm good. How are you the, guys? We're good. I mean, I'm, we're okay. We're basically the same story, you know? I mean, yeah. <laughs> We've been on somewhat of a lockdown for quite a quite some time now. Um, it's a bummer in a lot of ways, but it's also kind of a blessing in some. You know, I think one of the first things I noticed when we went into lockdown was the the idea of like photo shoots kind of becoming bleaker um, and yeah. illustration being commissioned a bit more. 
um, mm -hmm. just was a little bit more low risk to, to hire an illustrator than to set up a photo shoot, which is really unfortunate for some photographers, but fortunate oh, yeah. for the industry. So, yeah. so we met, we met at SCAD, right? Like, yeah, I think we met at like hallway or, or cafeteria or something. I can remember I was running to you as I was like, Hey, Tony, I'm Hannah. And you were like, Hannah Lee? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> but that was a really fast conversation, you know, because by the time you enter SCAD, it's the time I graduate. I moved to New York. So, mm -hmm. but I'm glad I'm here today virtually. <laughs> we can chat a little bit <laughs> totally i mean that was one of the reasons i wanted you on here because i just wanted to get to know you a bit more like scad is like is a really hustle and bustle environment and that's what i remember too is just randomly and casually brisk walking next to you on the third floor at scad <laughs> um and and i think the way that i really got to know you was via scad day so for those of you listening who are unfamiliar with scad day it's basically like a Saturday where prospective students, like they visit campus, instructors greet them and, and, and parents, you know, they, they fill the labs and lectures and demos are performed and people have questions and basically just a day for faculty to sort of be there for uh, students who are interested in the university. And, and it's also a place to show former and current student work. So, um, so that, you know, parents and, and prospective students can get an idea of the work that's being produced within a given department. And to prep for SCAD day, our, my boss, Rick Lovell, would pull former student works and the name Hannah Lee would always come up like, uh, oh, we need to put Hannah's out on the floor or did you grab Hannah's piece? Uh, don't forget to, to hang Hannah's piece, you know, and that's how I actually kind of knew you before I knew you was just the department sort of bragging on you. So oh, he's nice, Rick nice. <laughs> he's a fantastic human being. I miss him so much. Now, now I'm in, uh, in Tennessee teaching at MTSU, and he's one of one of the folks I miss I miss dearly. So you, so we met at SCAT. You were born in China, so you're in yeah. New York. Tell me about the transition. Did you attend school in China? Was what was your experience like there? And how did you get started? Like, I imagine you got started drawing early as a kid, but like, no, most of us do. Right. Yeah, that's why I, I prepared a little uh, brief uh, presentation for you guys and kind of like explain my background and how I get here and how to like how to start from zero and uh, my uh, also my former education in China. So I had a little PPT here. Yeah, I can show you guys. That sounds great. Yeah, I've just given you a uh, screen sharing uh, yeah, yeah. Hearing privileges, so go for it. Okay, so this, um, I'll give you guys a little uh, presentation about myself. So uh, my name is Hannah Lee, and I am freelance illustrator residing residing in New York. And uh, my work is mainly focused on editorial and children's book illustration. And um, I have worked with a client like the New York Times, the Washington Post, and I'm currently actually working with Penguin Random House UK for uh, young adult literature. Um, so before diving into my work, I would love to briefly share some of my previous background with you guys to have you know more about me and also to see why and how I make art from an uh, interest to a career. So this is me doodling on my blackboard and it's a drawing of my Nana. And that's pretty much how it all starts. That's awesome. And, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can show you my Nana's picture. He looks, she looks exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I just, I love doodle since I was a kid, you know? And if you know me in person and you would have fun with me like doodling and giggles like all the time. <laughs> And, and this is my dad and mom, and I grew up in the artist family, actually. And dad is a painter and printmaker, and mom is a writer. So by the time I was growing up, and I had no idea what illustration is. And I don't know what this so-called like artist means, you know? I just like, you know, like watch my parents do, and I mimic and I doodle and the giggles. <laughs> That's pretty much my childhood. So I feel like 
for me, everything just comes so natural. When I bury this little seed, like deep in, like deep into my mind, like I want to be an artist. Like even though I had no idea what it's all about, so I just keep doodling and drawing, but never take seriously or anything until high school. And why high school? <laughs>、um, so this is my high school called Yale Middle School, and it is one of the best school in China. And I was born and raised there. And the high school occupies lots of my memories. I had a really great six years there, and、uh, it, it is also during this time I made up the choice that I'm going to pursue art as a college major, and hopefully my future career. So、um, instead of doodle doodling for fun, I'm going to take it seriously this time. I decided because you know. In China,、uh, the entrance for university are quite competitive, and、um, because if if you are going to plan into、uh, like go to the university after high school, and、um, you have to take a national entrance examination called Gaokao, and、um, for the student who wants to go to the art university, and、um, you have to take a double examination, like one is for the general courses like math, Chinese literature. Geography, history, and stuff, and another one is like、uh, for professional tasks. It's like foundation drawing, gouache painting, and stuff like this to prove that you are qualified for your dream school. So this two crazy image are the scenes of the ex-、uh, entrance examination, and it is how we take the professional test. And I found these two images online, and it is the closest the same from my memory. So, like after the entrance, the jury jury team will lay down all the student work, and they will just go through one by one and do a couple of rounds to filter、uh, the good quality work. And this is work、uh, I've been practicing when I prepare for school. And in order to be like competitive for this task, so most of us tend to go take extra classes out of the high school, and do like a countless life drawing and figure drawing and sketching and the color theory, and they all look like this.、Um, the entrance examination are aimed for the student who has a strong foundation skills. Actually,、um, I mean you can do as stylized as you want, but You can draw abstract and all the style, but for the beginner,、uh, I think it's more realistic to do、um, such an objective and more like real realistic of the observation, you know. But <laughs> you may think I was going like I was a big grade and to get to the point where I am now, where I'm not. So my my score was pretty average compared to the other candidates. And the result is actually way far from the dream school I had by the time. So I felt,、um, but I still went to co-、uh, like university though. Instead, I went to a local comprehensive institute of science and technology, and my major was oil painting actually.、Um, and I、uh, nothing wrong with the school, and but by the time it just me feeling like. Strongly feel like this is not what I want to be honest, and I was depressed. And I realized I don't know how to draw anything rather than those realistic painting and drawing, you know.、Uh, but don't get me wrong, I I have nothing against、uh, fundamental practice. It's just me、uh, at that point of my life. I really urge for a change. So. I、um, I've seen the image on the newspaper and magazine, and of course, and those picture books. It just looks so happy. The image.、Um, so I wanted to make art and feel happy again, not just doing like some boring <laughs> practice, you know. So I chose illustration. And back to the time around 2009, I think. Uh, there were lack of majors in the art university of illustration, so、uh, I ended up here at Gap.、Uh, now that I think of the felt national entrance examination 
and especially those like boring fundamental practice, actually helped me build up skills and polish my dream. So uh, during my time as get get um, from college to a professional illustrator, this transition uh, can be a count as a second stage of my career. Um, so from building fundamental studies, and I started to developing a thing so called style. <laughs> so which I will explain it uh, in a second. Um, during the time I scared, I tried a different media and I experimenting around. Uh, all my assignments look kind of different. Uh, and I also worry about there's no consistency in my work, you know, and I worry a lot. Uh, now that I think back, this warrior is like painful, like it makes me like can't like isomania, you know, but it's a very necessary process. You have to consistently experiment if you want to be a, become a professional illustrator. Um, so um, I'll briefly explain style real quick, like for my understanding. Um, I feel like this work is overly discussed, both in uh, academic study and commission work now. Um, I believe that style is just simply how your work looks like. And in every once in a while, uh, I feel like it's worth to like analyze your style. For example, um, I often ask myself like, if my work are line driven or shapes driven? Um, if it's a line, how do I create lines in my work? Do I like to use rough and chunky lines or prefer delicate and thin lines? And um, if it's uh, shape driven, like the image on the right, um, do I have any certain ge geometry I like to apply in my work? Um, and same thing with color and texture, composition, rhythm, etc. Um, I think uh, your artistic style is the look and the feel of your work. And it is good to think about it, but not think too much. Um, so, I also feel like even if you don't like to like logically treat your illustration piece, uh, if you are honest enough to yourself, uh, after lots of practice, your style will just naturally flow. Like Rick Lowell mentioned once, and I asked this to him like often, I, I was like, Rick, how do I find my style? I'm struggling. And Rick was like, your style will naturally flow from your sketchbook, from your daily practice, which I strongly believe in that. Mm, like from your personal work, from your sketchbook, from your doodles, right? Um, and I often got the question from my students in China. They are like very curious about how to balance personal style and a commission style. Uh, I personally think there's no such thing like uh, that any commission work, I mean, a good client would require you to do a certain style that is not from you. Um, so you know what I mean? Um, so it's a good way to receive a right commission work is to do a lot of personal work. Um, so right now I'm at a stage of like being a freelancer. Uh, so far, I've worked with a few clients and I am a lucky one because most of my clients are being very respectful and based on my humble opinions. And clients actually are very simple. They just want to hire you for some existing work you've done. They hire you, hire you because of you. Uh, like this is actually one of my very first commission uh, while I was still uh, at SCAD. And clients sent me through um, Instagram, I think. Uh, it's an article about biology. And I never thought my work could like attract such topic, you know. Um, and they actually contact me with this image. So this image is a personal series I did. Um, it's based on a science fiction story I like called Three Body Problems. 
and I like one of the greatest things of being a illustrator is because you have your fully freedom to create anything based on like whatever you like, and those work can actually attract the right clients for you. Like this one、uh, leads to that biology piece, and they simply just ask for a similar like lab thing, so I made it happen. And similar experience I have here too, like the one on the left. Um, the last is a personal piece I did, and to be honest, it was such a spontaneous piece. I had a few of the keywords in mind, like、uh, childhood, coffee cat,、uh, vintage, toys, I lost,、um, and here we are. So the right blue one is actually from the Washington Post covers illustration, and clients specifically brought me with this red image on the left. And say she likes the composition and the way I tell the story through this tiny people with larger subjects.、Um, so yeah, and this is the whole series and the kind of show how it looks like in a real newspaper.、Um, so yeah, I think I have experienced a lot、um, like this, and the client finds you and they just like something you have done.、Um, This uh, this one I literally just submitted yesterday for a commission.、Um, it is a full page illustration for Bravery Magazine.、Um, it is、uh, it shows a、uh, hustle and bustle scenes of Chinatown, San Francisco, and they want me to combine the vibes of these two images.、Uh, like we can kind of see the similarity here. The one on the top it kind of like a nostalgic feeling. And、uh, but one on the button like a street scene, and we can go to the previous image again. Like this one, kind of have a feeling of the boat,、uh, but I pick the like a more flat perspective, like walk, like walking perspective here instead of a one point perspective. I think this way is like showing like better for mapping like this. So yeah, and so all this、um, I was talking about, like、uh, how I got this to to this point, and my previous struggle, and how my struggle leads me uh, the path uh, that uh, leads me、uh, to made up the plan. And during the time in the college, I used all the experiments I have, and I'm still building some more. To work as a freelancer,、um, and I treat、uh, each commission like a change, like for trying something new, and like little by little,、um, trying to be closer and close to my heart. And all this like work in process will enhance and keep polishing my dream. So、um, right now, I think I am at my third stage of my career. Which is another new start for me.、Um, I'm starting the fourth years working as a free, like full-time freelancer now, and I do have some like new thoughts coming and new feelings, and also I am unlock more goals I want to achieve. So one of the most important one is that I'm going to further enhance my personal voice. And those previous practice I had in China, like foundation skills, the things I like, I think it's so boring back to the time. And after school, like all the practice to develop myself, all this.、Um, in conclusion, it's actually just like building a part of my voice,、um, and it's like. Um, like if I say style is your personality, the voice is who you are as a person. Like style is your accent, but a voice is like how to express yourself, right?、Um, and style is like one of the most significant、uh, aspect of your voice, I think. And your voice,、um, it's much bigger than your style. Like the little, like little format I did here. 
like skill plus style and plus the topic you want to discuss in your work, and also your personal opinion towards the topic. Um, it's also included in your artistic voice. So, um, and also building voice, I think it's like a、um, lifetime mission. Like it is a constant thing you are achieving as an artist, and it needs you to practice and practice, and eventually you will start building up your voice. So I put a little like infinity sign here, and this is what I'm building and working on right now and for the future. So I feel like this is like maybe good to think about while、uh, still at school. And maybe this will help you feel less stressed or more easier to adapt the difficulty when you roll into a freelance world later. So, yeah, that's pretty much about it. I, I love the slide of how you、okay. narrowed down exactly what you wanted to be. That was actually something I was talking to my students about recently. You know,、yeah. it started with the I want to be an artist, then I want to be an illustration artist, and then the editorial artist. And that is such an important slide to show. You know, it's something that I preach to my students about often. You know, the idea of narrowing down your goals instead of declaring a vague dream. You know, of concept artists, for example. You know, I had students at SCAD who were graduate students, and I would ask them like, "What do you? What kind of illustrator do you want to be?" And then they would say, "Concept artist." And then they wouldn't be able to tell me any more about it. They wouldn't be able to tell me what company they wanted to work with. They wouldn't be able to tell me. Whether or not they wanted to do like creature design or environment design, that was it. That、right. was where their dream stopped.、And、That's me. I, I I previous like this. I told Rick I want to work like with Blizzard, but I don't have any portfolio to show. <laughs> yeah, and and I think that yeah, and it's so like, you know, instead of, you know, instead of declaring that, you know, tell us what company you want to work for. You know, like. Tell us the art director you want to work with. Like, don't be afraid to be crystal clear with your dreams. You know, they're、right. your dreams. They should be as detailed as possible. I think one of the reasons that folks remain vague with their dreams is so that maybe if they fail, it's okay because it was vague in the first place. But the clearer and more drawn out your dreams are, it's more likely that you'll cross paths with what you want in life. So I think that's really, really great point that I agree with, and also the idea of of your style being your personality. Like I love that. You know, it was actually I don't know if you knew Richard Goodwin. Did you know Richard Goodwin?、Mm-hmm, that's、yeah. a good friend of mine. <laughs> okay, yeah, I love Richard. Um, it, it, he was the one who taught me that. You know, like in many instances, style is who you are. It's your personality. It's what you bring to the world. I actually have several students who. Look like their artwork, if that makes any sense. Like、mm-hmm. we, have, we have Cassidy in in the session right now, and Cassidy Bidwell like looks and acts like their artwork right now. Right. And, and same for、um, Maggie Straley, Ellen Everett that are in the chat. These are students of mine right now. Like it's almost like their color palettes reflect into their work and into themselves and like the clothing that they wear. And it's so interesting.、Um, and I didn't realize this until Richard kind of brought that up to me. Um, and it's very rare that I meet someone who doesn't look and act like their work, if that makes sense. Actually, Doug Dabbs is one of the folks that I know who has like a dark style, but he's actually not like a dark human being at all in real life. Like he's the nicest guy in the world. So I think maybe he belongs to like a faction of artists whose style reflects what they want to see, rather than projecting who they already are. So I think it's good that you can see that there's a couple of、uh, of avenues that you can take with that.、Um, yeah. So, with that said,、um, you know, I, I feel like your education experience in China was much different than mine,、um, and probably much different than some folks in the states. But were there any instructors in that high school portion of your of your time that stood out to you? And do you think that like Education and art illustration, particularly, was necessary in order for you to obtain the career that you have now. Yeah, well, speaking of the instructor I had back in China, I think、uh, there was one person called Ran Guoxin, which I can link、uh, his work to you guys later. And he's、um, like、uh, same age with my dad, and he's、uh, my first mentor. And、uh, he's like a little different than the other teachers I had in China.、Uh, he doesn't teach me like 
strictly about like how to observe the scenes and like have me do repeatedly uh, artwork. Um, he will inspire me with a lot of like a, a how to be a person, how to do a right like behavior, and how like something things not related to my foundation practice, you know. But that really that concept really helped me a lot while I was developing my skills. So he's definitely one of the person I really admire. And um, after that, scared, you know, Rick Lovell. Yeah. <laughs> so I Rick is one of my heroes. Me too. And yeah, I know. So uh, there's um, speaking of like if you like have to attend to a school to like achieve the goal for your career, um, I think yes and no. Um, mm-hmm. Like for example, uh, right now there are a ton of like learning resource online, and um, except the college online classes, we have like Skillshare and Domestica. Um, I actually just bought a couple of courses while Domestica, um, but there's a, 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 a still a couple of things that may hard maybe hard to get access until like unless you go to a, a traditional college, uh, which is connection I think. You yep. may receive, yeah. You may receive a recommendation of your professor uh, or your friend about a potential opportunity, um, but it just depends, you know. Like I became a friend of Bill Meyer because of my professor Rick Lowell, mm-hmm. and they're both like my very important mentors. And I just so adapt to Rick's teaching style, uh, which is so like similar to the uh, professor run I have in China. So, and if it's not Rick, I wouldn't become a friend of you, right, Tony? So Definitely, yeah. This, this is this is a good thing about attending to school and be able to like you know meet the real person. For um, sure, yeah. I think yeah. that I think that higher ed gets a bad rap, and in many ways, deservedly so. You know, in in many instances, yeah. higher ed is is beyond expensive. You know, there's a chance mm-hmm. that you're gonna sit, you know, like as a student in a in like an area or like a pool of inexperienced and unqualified instructors, which is really sad reality. And there's also a strange unspoken belief, I think, among many students that as you, as soon as you graduate, particularly the BF, BFA student, that as soon as they finish, they're going to go online and find a job at Illustrator, you know, like wherever that yeah. is, right? you know, and, and students, I feel like often see their education as a kind of like, okay, I'm going to learn everything I need to learn and I will be proficient in all of it in four years. And perhaps that's not at the fault of the student, you know, like maybe that's the, the falsehood that lies within the ads that universities tend to put out. And, you know, and then it becomes ingrained in the minds of young teenagers at, who are making huge money decisions as teenagers. And it's a strange message that I think higher ed puts out to young people. Um, Right. So it, yeah, but but otherwise, as you said, you know, college to me was fantastic place to meet people of all kinds in a setting where I wouldn't otherwise meet them, you know. So my undergrad was was a huge culture shock, and I think it was because SCAD was so diverse in how many people were there. Like I met so many people from different parts of the world. I mixed with so many different folks at parties and 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 in class and. And that, in and of itself, to me, was worth the experience. So, hopefully, higher ed continues to have that effect on some students. So, yeah. so with that said, um, what did your start in the industry look like? I know that it, it becomes di- it's different for a lot of folks. Like for me, it was strangely enough, like the New Yorker came calling, and then from there, it all snowballed. Did you have a portfolio ready to go after you graduate, or did you need to kind of like for me, I needed to reassess. I needed some time to think. I think I took about a couple of years before I started really trying to create a portfolio. Um, or did you have one ready to go when you graduated? Well, kind of, yes. If we, uh, because we had uh, like a class uh, to like talk about portfolio stuff. So we kind of have to prepare one for the assignment, you know? But mm-hmm. uh, And if you go to my website or Behance, uh, which I can type it here, actually, that's like um give me one second yeah toss it in the chat there um this is this is an important i think it's an important question because there's a lot of pressure for students to have a perfectly marketable portfolio by the time they graduate 
And as an instructor, I've noticed that they don't always have that, you know, because I think that uncovering a style and experimenting in your sketchbook, as you said, to find that visual voice is right. it's not something that everybody can have on, you know, on the day of graduation. It's very fluid. Yeah. Yeah. I like based on my personal experience, experiments, uh, I I built up the website before graduate graduate from school and I had a Behance portfolio and the two links um, you can click on and if you scroll down uh, the work on the bottom are my previous portfolio actually and I do have an actual like a book you know the, the traditional portfolio but I never just never use it um, I think it's like definitely to worse to take advantage from social media nowadays. Mm -hmm. I think clients now are on Instagram a lot. Oh, totally. And they also find illustrators there, I believe. So I think it's like it's good to be prepared now. Maybe think about how to developing a website or like something like Behance, uh, like portfolio site. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I there's some important things I want to share. Like technically speaking. If you want to ask what composition, like what work should be included in your portfolio, and I would say to um, prepare the work that can precisely target to the clients you want to work in the future. Like, for example, if you want to work with a children's book publisher, you may need to prepare lots of work related to the children's topic, right? Like with educational purpose or simply just include some specific style in your work like a bright colors with positive light and lots of children's characters in it uh, would be a good fit and same thing with editorial illustration like if you want to work with a newspaper or magazine you may want to highlight not only the storytelling in your image or but also your opinion on, in it and the opinion towards the topic every day uh, we are talking about can be like a trending topic, can be certain like economy, politics, and etc. Uh, because at, at the end of the day, clients would just hire someone doing the existing work they need. So mm -hmm. keep your personal voice up and uh, wait them to come to find you is another way, I think. Definitely. I mean, all the research for that you would need to do to target. I mean, you just mentioned target uh, targeting clients. That's something that I would think is is relatively new, uh, a relatively new practice within the scope of illustration and its history. So many folks that I heard talk in New York who are well established illustrators like James Warhol, who is Andy Warhol's uh, nephew, and he did like a bunch of garbage pail uh, kids cards. Um, ben Catcher, uh, Anita Kuntz, a lot of these folks didn't start their portfolios to target a specific audience. And I could mm -hmm. tell that because I'd either ask them or in their presentations, they'd say things like, and then National Geographic contacted me and I was like, okay. You know, um, whereas I find more and more young and emerging illustrators who are active in the field now who are actually targeting people, you know, um, and the research is there. It's on the newsstands for those of you who are interested right. in tutorial and, and for book as well. You know, and you had mentioned that, you know, you're seeing a lot of your clients on Instagram. And that was several years ago, a big wake up call to me when the New Yorker started screenshotting my Instagram handle <laughs> and saying things to me like, hey, can you do something like this? And I'd be like, wait a minute. These folks are looking at me like, what's going on? So I stopped posting pictures of my animals and just made my account specifically for that because I knew that they were on there. So speaking yeah. of that. Do you take inventory on where your clients are coming from? That's almost always my first question when a magazine contacts me to do an illustration. I'll ask them where they heard, where they found my work, just so that well, I can be aware of which platform is more useful than the other. Yeah, sometimes they will just tell you, you know, they will bring the question for you. But I do really want to know, but I'm too shy to ask, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah, the, and 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 I think it's it's a good practice. But I mean, uh, for me it, personally, it's Instagram. Like, I, it was one of the reasons I just stopped posting to Tumblr was I just didn't. And and surprisingly enough, you would think that a lot of these directories, like three by three or, or Creative Quarterly Competition, ComArts, I've never received an email from somebody saying that they saw my work in ComArts, despite the mm -hmm. fact that that magazine or that that book gets shipped to so many 
art directors around the world and three by three as well. But it's yeah. mainly it's mainly art directors who just saw my work on Instagram um, yeah. or, or art directors who received mailers. Do you send out mailers? Uh, not really, actually. I used to send in postcards, but I'm trying. I don't know. I, I did that a couple of times. I'm not sure it's like efficient enough. Yeah. Know. Sometimes it feels like they don't work. I still feel like they do in a way. It just doesn't. They, they often don't provide that instant gratification that a response to an email does. But I think mm -hmm. that art directors do look at them. Um, there was a company in Japan that I worked with in 2011. Well, actually, no, I sent them a mailer in 2011 and I didn't hear back from them until 2014. So, um, and the reasoning behind that was apparently they just hadn't found something that would work with my style. So, but the art director was like, yeah, we look at mailers, we, that's our job, you know? So maybe that is, is, is a good form uh, to still consider in this digital world is that folks still like to hold things and receive things. Like I've heard that illustrators oftentimes will send gift baskets to their, to their uh, dream clients and which is hilarious, but so yeah. So process. So let's, I mean, talked a little bit about how you started and, and, and where you ended up let's take a look at that gorgeous process video like uh, could you share your screen and and just kind of walk us through that 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 gorgeous video that you sent me the other day actually oh i caught glimpses uh, of it yesterday but i wanted to wait and enjoy it with you all um with your commentary against it and as we talk about process as well so yeah your process is as i told you via email it it seems, according to this video, a lot more intricate than I imagined it was initially, which is really interesting to, to, to see that. Um, it, you have like a really strong command over digital media to a point where it doesn't feel very digital. When I look at it, it feels very traditionally composed. Yeah, um, I think that's uh, because my uh, traditional media background, like I use that color, watercolor pencil and the gouache and watercolor a lot before. So even I draw it digitally now, I still like wanted to uh, uh, bring some traditional touches in my work. I, I, I think that's one of the reasons, also a uh, part of my style, I think. Um, yeah, I. I, I know my process may look a little bit complicated, but I do actually just, I have a really simple logic behind it. I usually would just start to like think about the outline of the work. Like I will just do it real quick. So uh, I'll just um, think about outline and kind of like treat the brush as a watercolor pencil and just draw it stroke by stroke. and. After I figure out all the um, like the shapes, the outline and stuff, and I, I will just start adding the lines in the shape. So um, I'll just fast forward real quick. I can share this vid video with you guys if you guys want. Yeah, actually, yeah, you had sent me one, so I'll I'll uh, I'll upload it to uh, I'll upload a link to it to our uh, our D2L shell so that students can access the video. I love that look. It's very pastel crayon vibe. Yeah. So for the details, I just use the lasso tools and to like uh, switch the brushes. The brushes I use is uh, mainly from Kyle Webster. And I also purchased some from uh, True Grid Texture, uh, which I can type it here as well. They, could re they make really good brushes. Oh, wait, I can't yes. find the chat. Yes, please send us that link. That'd be great. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. You know, those true grit brushes are amazing. I use those quite a yeah. bit too. Yeah, true grit. Uh, am I spelling wrong? No, I don't think so. <laughs> true grit texture. And another one is Ritual Supply, I think. Ritual Supply. Yeah. Yeah, this treat. I really love the true grid texture brushes I make. So yeah, um, 
I mean, all the, like the texture you guys are seeing, like on the background right now here, is actually from True Grit. The uh, vintage old paper or something, I couldn't remember. Yeah, I'm, I think the way that I draw is like spontaneously, like I'll think about the shape, random shape over here. And then I'll like quickly switch to another. <laughs> There's no clue. <laughs> but I mainly think about the outline though, the shapes, like how the style, the shapes will be and um, stuff like that. I'll start from the shape. I like to use lasso tools. Um, ah. How how long does it take you to bring one of these to full finish, like from from ideation to final art? Uh, you mean from sketch to the final, or the process of the final people? Uh, yeah, like from sketch to to final. Mm, uh, that depends. I think. Um, I think I'm kind of slow to uh, on deciding which sketch I'm going to like refine. But I I will just normally start with a lot of really rough, like really, really rough sketches. And um, I can show you guys like some of the, it's like um, something like this or like this. Like really rough, and I I'll, I'll do a ton a bunch, and then I will pick one to start refine. And for the coloring process, I think it usually takes like for this video, I think it's uh, five five hours, five to six hours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, more or less. Very very conducive to editorial. Very quick turnaround time. Uh, yeah, I still remember the first time I worked with the New York Times. I, they were calling me around like 10 a.m. in the morning and I was sleeping. <laughs> and, and I almost missed the work and I was like, I'm so sorry I missed a call and and I feel so regret. But they're like, uh, if you like be like uh, calling us like in in 10 minutes, minutes later, we will give this job to the others, but you are in time. So they still gave me this, uh, this job. And the deadline was in 24 hours. Like after 24 uh -huh. hours, the, the piece has to be like print out. So I have to give them to time to edit. Yeah. yeah. That's a quick yeah. turnaround time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, just to follow up your, quick, uh, your statement about taking five hours to complete. Because some students listening yeah. to that will see like, wow, you know, I might spend something like 20 hours on a piece like this. How long did it take you to get to that particular state? Because I know a lot of it is, you know, you're so comfortable with your style and the way you want to visually communicate things. If you were doing like a similar piece when you were a student, um, how has that changed in regards to like the process or just the overall time applied to it? You know, that's a really, really good question because Back to uh, a few years ago, I was, I like for a piece, not saying like 20 or 30 hours, I think like two, one, one or two weeks, mm -hmm. I struggle like back and forth and I added and regret and erase everything and cry and I freaked out. And <laughs> I just go back and on. Uh, but uh, I, I personally do, I have feeling like uh, I work faster now. I think that's because like I practice a lot. Right. Like uh, last year, I believe I did uh, over a hundred pieces of illustration, and uh, last year I've learned a lot from the commission I had, which is a book. So it it requires me to like do a work and in a certain time, but with the execution, like complete execution. I think practice uh, is it is a very like important key to have you work work fast but good. But I've been in the process. Uh, if you take a longer time, if you worry a lot, if you go back and forth, it's natural just trying to like, don't be too nervous and stressed like I did. I, I can't sleep, you know, back to the college. I was such a warrior. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's a great answer. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I always use I always use cooking as a reference. I love to cook when I talk about illustration. Um, yeah. it's, it's like kind of my thing, and and I I I've experienced a yeah like a, a drastic decrease in time for how long it takes me to finish something. Um, I think that when you're learning how to cook something, it takes a lot longer to finish it. You know, obviously. Um, whereas, you know, as soon as you've made that recipe numerous times, you just start to make it much quicker than you would have when you first started. And so, right. so that's definitely, you know, and, and I think what's a bummer about that to some people is, is that it, again, it's not, that doesn't sit within the realm of instant gratification. You know, there's lots of grunt work that has to go into that, um, and time, you know, and I, and I feel like sometimes that t tends to be like the short answer you know that folks don't want to hear you know oh just take some time you know it takes time yeah. you know yeah. but it really is it really is an important thing to consider the the notion of patience yeah yeah i think i've heard um uh, uh our director from new yorkers and uh we asked uh, like how to like achieve the goals like how to receive the commission like how to become an editorial speaker and she simply just said you draw every day and she said this might be the boring boring like answer i have for you guys but this is the truth like truly true so. doug what are your thoughts on that because i know i know that you you like to be more specific you know um when it comes to i think that the whole the whole practice makes perfect thing i feel like we can agree on doesn't really work if you're practicing the wrong thing right I right yeah i think you can have you can ingrain bad habits into yourself so especially like knowing how to practice and i think it's one of the things that's what we talk about it's great about school it's like Ideally for school, the ultimate thing, yeah, you, you, it's nice to have like good artwork, but learning how to learn, how to teach yourself after is going to be really important. And just knowing what those strengths and weaknesses are. Cause yeah, I think I've seen a lot of times people just draw over and over and over and the artwork might be changing, but they're not necessarily improving because they might have some bad habits. They're just ingraining into themselves. Um, so it's just, it's, it's just knowing how to look at your work and like, thinking about and just trying to be as objective as possible. Like, this is what I'm really good at. This is what my strengths are, or this is my style. This is one of the things that I'm gonna have to lean on quite a bit. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is something like Tony and I've talked about a ton and, you know, it's like the answers that y'all were saying too, is that, you know, no, you just got to draw every day or no, it comes with time. And that's kind of dismissive. Um, and it's just like understanding what to do with that time. Or if you are drawing, you know what are some of the things that you are you're practicing or becoming better aware with yeah and that actually reminds yeah. me of that of that uh wiley beckert article that i've been sharing around um it's so it was such a great article on muddy colors i put it in the chat for you tucker um i think it's good for your students to know about it um it's uh it's a really important lesson that i feel like wiley imparts on us um, and for those of you who don't know, Wiley Beckert is a fantastic illustrator. I highly recommend taking a look at Wiley's stuff. Um, and she did an article recently for Muddy Colors talking about, like, if you teach a man to fish, you know, we've all heard this, right? He'll be eating fish for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. If you teach him to teach himself to fish, <laughs> you've given him the fundamental life skill of figuring things out on his own. And then after that, a whole world of skills are now finally within, you know, that person's reach, um, you know, and, and I think that's such a great, fantastic message. Um, and she even provides a variety of, of techniques to help you to teach yourself to, to learn to teach yourself. Um, and there's a variety of folks that I know who are just naturally like this and some folks who I know who taught themselves to be like this. I feel like my father is one of them, you know, and her steps are basically, you know, identify a teacher, you know, somebody that you can choose as a role model. I feel like Hannah's already talked about Rick Lovell and Rick Lovell was one of my role is, is one of my role models as well. Um, and, and just look at somebody who's succeeded at the thing that you're trying to do and preferably someone with a strong online presence so that you can kind of 
retrace their footsteps and dig through the, the like what they've done. Um, and, and, and this is the person that you would like to ask a ton of questions to, but you're not going to, <laughs> you're going to write down all of the questions that you'd like to ask them. And then, you know, basically start with your, your big ones, you know, like why, you know, why did, why did they do this, you know, and try to understand something about the nature of the problem so that you can sort of sit with it as opposed to just, you know, doing the, the first thing that comes to your mind, which is email the instructor or, or, you know, whatever it may be that you think is going to be the quickest way to get there. Um, and then I think another one of her recommendations was to identify what she refers to as true questions. So you dissect the why, um, and then, you know, you don't, necessarily ask them you know like why should why would somebody choose one printer over another you know and, and 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 she says that some people ask her these questions about where she prints her cards you know like she makes these card decks and she says one of one of the printers is better you know <laughs> i use the best one and then people are like why don't you tell me exactly what you're what you're talking about and she's like well that's not going to help you at all you know go go dig through some forums go dig through 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 the interwebs and and you will find the answer to the to these questions, um, and then you try to answer the, exactly. You try to answer them on your own, um, and and this is you know there have been very few people over the years who have imparted this lesson um, to me as well, and it's it's never an easy thing you know when they're like yeah you need to you need to dig through this and do the, do some research, but every single time I've had those folks kind of like on my back about something, I've always come out a better person, like a, a more um, uh, more prone to critical thinking and solving problems. But the article is really great. My summary, I always try to redo stand up comedy and things and it never works out. I can never tell the joke exactly the same. The art, go read the article. Doug's laughing at me. <laughs> go read, go read the article. The article is way better than I'm summarizing it. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good message. I mean, stay practicing, stay curious, and keep thinking, keep keep digging, exploring. You get yeah. there. If you go deep enough into like what she's talking about, um, and and really try to dig into the true questions, you know, get they get to like the the bare bones of the issue that you're trying to to solve, and you know, putting yourself in Rick Lovell, for example, in Rick Lovell's shoes, you know and try to ask yourself, you know, like whether or not you can solve this, you know, and you'll, you'll, and this has happened to me on numerous occasions where I've discovered that there were never any questions that I really needed to ask Rick, um, that I knew them all along, you know, that the gatekeeper to the knowledge that you were looking for, um, was actually just you and you were capable of crossing that threshold by yourself. Um, and I think that this is the, the, the moment that you real, that you sort of transcend the student teacher relationship you know um and that's one of the reasons i'm constantly telling my students to disagree with me you know call me out like let's have a conversation like don't just yeah. agree with everything i'm saying yeah the discussion really helps this piece is gorgeous hannah <laughs> so so do you have any advice uh, for illustrators who are at the start of their career? Uh, yeah, I think except the like, like technical things like draw and stuff, I think like, uh, keep your mentor health is a big part because if you say a freelance illustrator, you may think, oh, this is like such a, a relaxed leisure lifestyle. It sounds so perfect. But if you're really in the industry, you'll, you'll realize being a freelancer is, freelancer is extremely difficult. Like you have to think about how to pay your next bill, how to draw something you like, but also you can track the clients, you can get a job. And there's also so many things going on after graduation. So uh, I've seen a lot, uh, some of my friends like had to break down and I think the mentor health and towards this uh, career it's really it's another a good thing we kind of ignore uh, while we are in school but it's it, it will come later so I think it, it is like important to think a little bit like right now 
to how to balance. I think balancing is like a really、uh, wisdom in your life. Yeah, I agree. That, yeah, yeah, I think that you know you should also you know know what you want to draw about. You know, this is a job where that you can cultivate from the ground up based on the imagery that you enjoy, that you actually enjoy doing. I think that's one of the risks that you take when you put all the marbles in on a on a on a career that is so fulfilling. You know, like I just I just wrapped up a piece with Rolling Stone. I got to draw like a cool guy with I don't really like his music, but <laughs> I got to draw this guy with really cool sunglasses and concerts and hearts on fire and guitars and. It's like that's what I love to draw, you know, and and you know, a career as an illustrator can put you in situations where you get paid to draw what you love to draw, you know. So like, if you love to draw dragons, like do that, like put that in your portfolio, you know. It's always so strange to me when when you know students, especially graduate students, are like, I don't know what to draw. I'm like, you don't know what to draw at this point in the game. You've got to know what you love, you know. And yeah, really, as as Hannah has mentioned numerous times, like. It's really important to research and become familiar with the markets that you want to work within. You know, if you're yearning for editorial, as I said, your research is sitting at a Barnes and Noble, you know, CVS, Publix.、Um, make it a habit to flip through the publications on their shelves, and you'll notice, you know, you'll notice the pattern of what these magazines are consistently purchasing when it comes to illustration. You know, I looked at every issue of Rolling Stone magazine. That was my dream client, and I cultivated an arsenal of what they were buying in my head before I started making a, a, a portfolio, and take advantage of social media, as Hannah has been mentioning, you know, and and yeah, obviously not an Instagram that showcases artwork of your cat or your night at a bar, you know, like make it professional. Show us what you're you're trying to deliver, you know, because serious illustrators like Hannah, if you look at Hannah's social media. It's like specifically and exclusively dedicated to the work that Hannah wants art directors to see, you know. And I think another common misconception is is thinking, you know, just with inside the U.S. You know, think globally. It's very easy to limit yourself to U.S. markets, but the Gulf and East Asia they're huge emerging markets for illustration, you know. So stay ahead of the curve, research them. You know, and yeah. So I think that at some point this becomes more than just drawing pictures. You have to start thinking and acting like a business. You know, professionalism is key for picking up or you know maintaining repeat clients and 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 picking up new ones. So it's really important to be organized, consistent, and you know, learn to balance your portfolio. With both the narrative and the conceptual, and I think that's something that Hannah does really well. That's one of the reasons I had Hannah on here. It's like you see these intense, really smart pieces, and then these other pieces that are just beautiful and story-driven.、Um, and and art directors find it really useful to see your process as well. That's huge. That's something that we're really trying to promote at MTSU is the importance of process work, so that. Students, prospective students, art buyers—they can see how the students arrive at the answers that they arrive at. You know, it's just like showing your work in math. You know,、um, and and when art directors can see that, they'll have a better idea as to like what they can expect from you when you actually work with them. You know, it, I often I say this pretty often, but you know,、um, when I work with a client. It, it, you would think that their first impression of you is your portfolio that exists on your website, but their real first impression of you is that tight sketch that you send them, you know, when they need it in in a very quick time frame, as as Hannah mentioned. So in a lot of instances, it's not your fully finished portfolio that makes them decide whether or not they want to work with you again, but that first turnaround, you know, and that's when I get real serious with people like Rolling Stone, like. I pump out those sketches really quickly. I want them to remember that I can do it、uh, quickly, you know. And so, you know, anyone who professes to be interested in illustration,、um, you know, as a career, as a as a side hustle, you have to work a lot to obtain that success. It's like starting a restaurant, you know. As you're starting out, make work for yourself, and imagine whether or not it's good enough for the clients that you're wanting to work with, you know. 
research your dream clients and what they've purchased in the past and imagine how you can fixate yourself to that particular market of illustration. Yeah, this is a really good advice. And uh, there's one thing you can think of, like if you're doing a personal work in the meantime, you can do some like job oriented work. Uh, you can do it both at the same time. And something like your style, a part of style, maybe it's like you are carrying them naturally and they will flow eventually. But you can kind of like force yourself to try certain technique and certain things. And to make sure you are able to do this and uh, and doing the sketches, like uh, refine sketches and show the all uh, the process is important because the client really needs to see how to execute a piece. Uh, they have to know that you are stable in your own style and the way you are drawing. So I think Tony just uh, offered a really good advice. And I really like the the style carrier and the style forcer, the, the concept you mentioned before. And um, maybe we can talk about this. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's something that I love to talk about. I've been trying to, <laughs> sometimes I think maybe I repeat myself a little too much, but I love talking about <laughs> it because I feel like it's really real. It's It wasn't anything that anyone taught me or shed light on, you know, it was just something that I found to be a real thing. And so the style forcer is, I feel like I'm very much so a style forcer. So if you look at somebody like um, Sterling Hunley or Gary Kelly, and you look at their drawings from when they were like little kids, or like, you know, in, in their early days of schooling, you can see similarities between their young versions and then their professional versions of themselves. They, to me, are style carriers. They've always kind of drawn the way that they've drawn uh, and created images the way that they've created images. Um, and it's not to say that they didn't grow and they didn't evolve. They did. It's just the, 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 the evolution, the gradual evolution of that was, it was gradual. It wasn't abrupt. Whereas like somebody like me, if you look at my stuff from 2008, it looks r um, intensely different from what my current portfolio looks like. And that's because there was an intentional shift. There was a, a shift in the tracks. I decided one day to go a different direction completely. Scrap everything that was natural to me, that came natural to me, to start something new. Um, and that I think is, it's good to know that those two things exist because it gives you choice. It gives you a, a, a control over your life. It gives you control over the images you're making. Um, and that at any point, whatever you're doing that comes naturally to you, you can kick that to the curb and create something new that, that, that will eventually come naturally to you. Um, so that's basically the style, the style forcer versus the style carrier, you know, is, is someone who makes, a uh, uh, a, a conscious decision to scrap everything they're doing to start something completely new. And I've had a couple students who've done that recently, and I've been so proud of them because it's a really courageous thing to do. You know, uh, one of my students, Ellen Everett, recently did this. And also one of my students, Macy Blake, recently did this. And it's just so awesome to see that kind of bravery happening. Um, when, when it's just a lot easier to just kind of stick to what you've always known and to just do what you've always done. Um, it takes a lot of courage to be able to do that, to take yourself outside of your comfort zone like that. So that is, that's the general idea that I have when it comes to the style forcer versus the style carrier. If I remember correctly, Doug, um, I think, I'm not sure if it was you who told me this or if it was Chris Brunner who told me this, but I think it was one of y'all who said that Chris Schweitzer just always drew like that. Like nobody was ever going to change Chris. Chris is probably body. both of us then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like, I mean, you, 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 some people just have a thing and it's their thing. And that's right. Right. And I think it depends on like, you know, the medium or industry because, you know, he's a, he's a visual storyteller. He does a lot of graphic novels, comic books. Um, he's done children's books. And I think he gets to the level where it's not necessarily about pushing the, the visual aspect, just more what the visuals are doing and how they're communicating different emotional components or storytelling components. So um, it's not any different than like Bill Watterson with Calvin and Hobbes. Like Calvin and Hobbes didn't really change that much from when it first premiered in like 85 to when it went off like in 95. 
Um, but what he was doing is like he had like this this staple and he was trying to use that as well. Um, so yeah, so it's like it's I think that's something Chris really honed in on is like he knew he had like a style and it was his approach and it came natural to him. And if it became natural, like what can I do to help communicate certain aspects? And in this case, it was communication through storytelling. So he capitalized on that. Um, and it also helps too. Like his stuff is very cartoony. Um, I mean, first himself as a cartoonist, um, and it's simple in its in its rendering. But he does that so it can be deciphered quickly, and sequentially for very purposeful reasons. Yeah, you you take one look at his stuff, and it's like you know that he's capable of just about anything he wants to be capable of. But he's like very. <laughs> I think he's some time to do other things too. You're right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. He's very, very particular about it. And it's really, for those of you who don't know, Chris Schweitzer, um, I mean, he, he had a show at MTSU recently. Um, mm -hmm. Definitely check out Chris Schweitzer. I just purchased some, some prints from him. I was super jealous of your Raiders uh, print that you have in your office. And I'd considered stealing it from you a couple of times. I know. I only put it up when I know you're coming to my office. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but, I and I didn't think he had it available, but he did. I don't know if he just like recently put it up in his shop or something, but I, I picked one up like quickly. I picked that one up and the uh the uh, last crusade. So he just has to do Temple of Doom and my life will be complete. Um the gorgeous illustrator, uh, artist, cartoonist, definitely the crystal check skull. Out. You forgot about that one. Oh yeah, I gotta have the crystal skull. <laughs> Wait, what heard, about the Shia LaBeouf one? <laughs> that is the Crystal Skull one. He's Shia's oh, the Crystal Skull one. Yeah, I, I, I think don't that know. The, I heard a uh, Spielberg talking about the idea of um, doing a a new Indiana Jones, but with the the lead being a, a female, like a female lead of Indiana Jones. Um, I'd be super pumped to see that. Yeah, I'll go watch anything from that franchise. It's 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 addicting. So, so yeah, Hannah, this is fantastic. I really appreciate your time today. Um, you know, thank you so much for lending us your time. I'm seeing some folks in the chat. Ellen says, it's been so inspiring seeing the evolution of your art and seeing your craft, uh, seeing you craft your work into a style that's closer and closer to your heart. I've related so much to everything you've said about being a warrior and redoing things over and over during experimentation phases. Seeing you come out of the other side of that and making the art that you want to create is so incredible. Hearing you has been so helpful. Helen's awesome. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Ellen. Ellen. <laughs> I appreciate. I really appreciate. It's made my day. I'm happy. Oh, <laughs> you're welcome. You're amazing. I'm just. Ah, oh, I'm so glad I came to this. That's awesome. Oh, thank you. If you guys are so sweet. If y'all have any questions, uh, there's a, a few folks in here. If y'all have any questions about uh, for Hannah. Um, or just comments that you want to put out there, go for it. You've got Hannah at your uh, at your fingertips right now. Hey, can I jump <laughs> real quick, Tony? Yeah. Um, so I, I, I don't want to hijack the, the conversation and make it not applicable to your illustration students, but um, just for my... We just, we just talked about Indiana Jones for like two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> if we could just talk about Indiana Jones a little bit more. Um, <laughs> no, I was going to ask, um, like... For, uh, because a lot of these guys have kind of chosen illustration as their um, interest, their, their point of interest in, in the art world. Um, but a lot of my guys are still kind of back at that, like, I want to be an artist stage of this. And they haven't really moved um, forward to figure out what, what they want to be concentrated in. Um, and, and Hannah, I'm interested to get your opinion about this. And then Doug and uh, Tony, you guys could jump into, but like, what advice would you give uh, like 16 or 17 year olds who maybe want to be um, in the art world, but aren't really sure where they want to be concentrated. If that makes sense. That's a really good question. And that's a, my old time struggle <laughs> as well. I want to be an artist and I, but I think it's good to learn and know what really the artist is about. I think the artist is more like a lifetime career. Um, illustrator in some points like a thing, but uh, illustrator illustrations like more commercial towards commercial. Um, sometimes you have to do like uh, something and other people like certain topic you want to talk about. 
And the illustration is more like a problem solving, like visual problem solving. But fine arts is more like a creating a personal topic, and you have you kind of like a thought that like you explain that、uh, question over and over for the rest of your life. And I think maybe this is a good example, like a,、um, explain the differences between like fine arts and illustration. So、uh, it's nice, nice to think about it.、Um, but I, the more importantly is stick to what what things you really enjoy doing and what things you really like and what things you really believe in.、Um, I think that's the one of the most important things. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think it's figuring out what you enjoy because when I mean, you're getting into the arts, you know, you're doing it because you enjoy it, not because you think like, "Oh, this is the easiest way I'm gonna become a millionaire." Sure, I'm gonna do this. I mean, there's some type of passion that you can't ignore, and that's why you want to get into that particular field. And I've also seen the mistake too with some students, and I understand. I did the same thing too. Is you you pick a career that you think is going to give you more success, even though it's something you don't necessarily enjoy, like. You have to do that because when you're out of school, there's no one telling you like you need to do this project and you turn this assignment. This is what you do at this time. You can meet at that time. It's all up to you. So what you have to do is like say like okay, what's going to drive me every day? What's going to make me passionate? And right now, like you don't have to come up with that solution. But what I would do is just get a little bit more familiar with different industries. So for example, there's a lot of people who love working in animation industry. And there's some people after researching it or majoring it decide to change their mind. I'm not picking on animation; it could be any field.、Um, but just thinking about like what type of lifestyle do you want to have? Do you want to be more individual? Do you want to be more of a collective whole? I mean, there's no right or wrong answer.、Um, and even if you decide to change your mind, that's okay. Because like Hannah was saying too, it's just you see people go in fields all the time where they focus on illustration and they focus on. Fine art,、um, you know, you don't see somebody. Well, I should say you don't, but it's it's probably more the exception where you see see, see one follow within one particular field their entire career. Of course, they're gonna start dipping their toe in other careers too, and that's okay as well. But I think just getting as familiar as you can with different industries and seeing which one、um, appeals to you the most. I agree. Everything else. Yeah, I was gonna. That, that's what I would have said as well. You know, I mean, what what Doug said about asking yourself questions about what you want. You know, I mean, when I when I was interested in being in and choosing representation, because I, I have an agent for illustration, just makes things easier for me. I had to ask myself a lot of questions. You know,、um, and I've heard a lot of horror stories about artists and reps. You know, and so. It was pretty much fifty-fifty, you know. Like I could be in a bad relationship with a representative or in a good one, and I didn't know, and I just figured to take a risk on that. But I had to ask myself questions, you know. Like I had to ask myself, like, what is the industry standard for a rep to take in terms of percentage from from the work that you're creating, and and do I want to be a part of an agency that has like five hundred artists on roster? Or do I want to be a part of an agency that has a smaller amount of artists? And I knew that I wanted more personal contact with my agent, like more of a relationship. I didn't want to feel like a number, so I had decided that I would look for an agency that was small. And then I decided that I would look for an agency that was new、uh, and not reputable, because I feel like an agency that's new has a lot of reason to hustle and to earn a name for themselves.、Um, and then you know. Do I want to work solely for that agency, or do I want to be able to procure work outside of that agency? You know, because some agents will lock you in to just only being able to work for the stuff that they get you,、um, and I didn't like that idea. So I mean, just like that with life, with art in general, you have to ask yourself questions. You have to weigh out the pros and cons. You know, I think that one of the biggest differences between fine art and illustration is that I think that fine art can kind of get away with being more white collar, where Illustration, I think, is a combination of the two. You know, the blue collar, relatable stuff, and then the white collar, chin scratcher stuff. And somebody who writes about this beautifully is Sterling Hundley, <laughs> and、um, he、uh, has a, a book called、uh, Blue Collar, White Collar, where he talks about this、um, and dives into it a lot more elegantly than I could. And what's really cool about, I think, art in general is that you can always hop on board、uh, any given avenue. It's not like sports or like cycling where you become obsolete after age thirty or something like that. 
you know, I've, I've learned of a variety of folks who became, who pursued their creative dreams well into their 40s, 50s, and 60s. One of my favorite musicians, uh, singer songwriters, Amos Lee, um, was an English teacher, like high school English teacher for decades. And I think his music career took off in his early 40s. You know, so that's what's really one of the things that I think is really cool about the creative career and the pursuit of a creative career is uh, it's a it's one of those things that you can hop on board, you know, um, and then start learning about at any point, really. Um, and, and you can achieve success at any point, really, you know, depending on how much you ask yourself those questions. I love all of that. Thank you, guys. Um, I, I feel like it's important for them to hear at this age because I think failure is such a weird word and and it's something that you know there's kind of a, a right path and a wrong path that that uh people feel like um is in front of them and um you know experimenting and figuring out what you want even if you change your mind later it doesn't mean it's a failure and so i think that's important um and like you said there's plenty of people who do one thing for you know 20 years in their career and then they completely shift so uh, yeah and and I, had, I had think I had told your group this last time, I, and I think it's super important to reiterate. It's really easy to get lost in the ether of life. It's really easy to let time go by. It's really easy to hang out with your friends with no time limit. It's just really easy to let the days flow, you know, without anything happening. Be mindful. Be so mindful of what you're doing. Um, I used to, I used to have just this kind of mentality where like I'd go, I used to skateboard with my friends in high school and we, there was no time limit. It was just like, yeah, we're going skating. You know, there was no like, yeah, maybe we'll show up here later. There was no structure, you know? And, and as soon as, and I told this to some of my students recently, as soon as I started writing about my day and actually seeing what I had accomplished in the day, I was able to sort of, not let it flow by like nothing happened, but be deliberate about my time, you know, um, because when, when you see what you actually do in a day, it could make you feel awful. You know, it could really like if you see if you read two or three pages of what you did in a day, especially during this pandemic, I woke up, I had some pretzels, I played video games, I went to Chick-fil-A. And you actually read how depressing that is. Like it, it really makes you feel, you know, like, oh gosh, what did I do with the day? You know? Wait, that sounded like a good day, dude. <laughs> <laughs> and, and maybe that is, maybe that is, you know, maybe what that the is. Heck? Maybe that's what some people need, you know, like maybe that's what some people need at certain times, you know. I just I remember personally, you know, starting to write and looking at my day and thinking, like, man, I could have done so much more. Like if I had I didn't need to do this particular activity for four and a half hours. You know, like I just started having those. You didn't need to watch all three Indiana Jones films. <laughs> including <laughs> Crystal Skull. I mean, come on, what a waste of time. How many times have I seen those movies? So many times, you know? So I think that, you know, being super deliberate uh, um, was a game changer for me. It just, it was a huge game changer. Um, so I know it's really easy again to let the days go by, but just ask yourself what you want out of those days. Maybe it is, uh, you know, Chick-fil-A and video games. Maybe that is what you need, you know? Um, but yeah, I think, and I, I feel like I've talked about this so much. Folks are probably so sick of me talking about that. I just think it's important. It's real. Yeah. So what are you currently working on? Are you working on any cool projects we can expect to see published soon? Or are you under NDA? Can we not talk about them? Sorry, but my answer? What's that, it, Hannah? Are you, ask, are you asking me? Sorry? Yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah. Sorry, I'm, I, sorry I, I missed the question. Will you please ask oh, me I was just I was just asking, like, what are you, are you working on any, any cool projects that we can expect to see published soon? Oh, yeah, actually there's a book I finished last year. It's coming. Actually, let me leave you guys in. Are you, are you allowed to <laughs> I, talk about it? Yeah, I mean, okay, yeah, cool. of course. I'm not. I'm not allowed to like share it publicly, but I can share with you guys here. Okay, I'll, I'll make sure. I'll yeah. make sure we don't. We don't upload this part. <laughs> yeah. Don't take screenshot. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, this is a book. I work with a publisher in UK, and it will um, publish this year, both in English and Chinese. I think. 
Um, it's a non-fiction book. I'll just show a few pages uh, with you guys. So this is a big project that kept me busy last year. So I guess this is the biggest news for me right now. And I'm working on a, a young adult literature uh, with uh, Pigeon Random House right now. Uh, with that, I'm not, not allowed to talk about. <laughs> I'm pretty much just like focused on children's books lately and the several editorial pieces. I love oh, I've got a question. So for a project like this, you know, you get you get the project and you've got a deadline you've got to meet. But this is a pretty seems like a pretty big project. You know, each of these pages has a good amount of art on it. Are you feeling any like uh, strain getting stuff done in time or is this easy? I always feel nervous about the deadline because the deadline now I'm not sure if it's like always like this or the the recent years becomes more like rapid I, I'm not sure but the deadline is like normally they'll just offer maybe for example for one piece or for one page they'll uh, give me from sketches to final like under a week including the back and forth uh, detail and discussion so yes in the process I'm always still nervous but uh, I'll feel slightly better once I get the uh, sketches approval down. Um, I feel like my emotions like always like roller coaster, you know, like mm -hmm. uh, sometimes up, sometimes down. And doing work is, is always challenge. But like I said before, I, I'm working faster than before now. I couldn't imagine if I'm drawing a book like this, but if a few years ago, what it would be like. So like Tony says to I can make a plan for now. Otherwise, I, you will adapt adapt the difficulty later. You yeah, know? you're already thinking about the next page and the page after that. Yeah. So yeah, that's um, pretty much my updates for recent. That's so beautiful. Yeah. That's gorgeous, Hannah. <laughs> well, we, you know, this has been fantastic. We're gonna go ahead and wrap this up. Um, I'm going to send uh, Tucker a link to the demo video um, and I'll share the video on our D2L as well so that our students at MTSU can access it. You are so kind for lending us your time here today, Hannah. I'm so happy that we got to catch up and, and get to know each other a little bit better beyond just that, that casual hallway interaction that we had several years ago at SCAD. Um, your work is fantastic. I'm so proud of you. Um, and mega congrats on all of your success. And I really hope we can do something like this again in the future. Does anybody have any, any last minute questions for Hannah or comments? I've seen a, a few comments here and I haven't done reading it. I really want to read it. Oh, <laughs> you guys are so kind of sweet. <laughs> yeah. So and I, thanks for having me. Yeah. I'm yeah really, I have fun today. Yeah. Lizzie said, I love when you said that you like to like to combine your traditional education into your illustration that is something i can really relate to i am a painter so combining traditional methods and design is something i love and what i have loved to see today through your work thank you so much for sharing this work is gorgeous thank cassidy thank said you. thank you it's been difficult to figure out style and i'm often hit with self-doubt but style is simply your interpretation of the things you're passionate about i am just now embracing this type of thinking thank you so much hannah it's so nice to hear your experience with the industry and what what has helped you progress and evolve. You're amazing. Oh, oh thank you. Oh, super, thank you. I'm flattered. Well, I thank hope you all have a great weekend. Stay safe. Best of luck to everybody. It was fun hanging out with y'all. And I look forward to the next one. Hannah, stay in touch and keep killing it. Thank you, Hannah. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, guys you for everyone. Having us along too. Of course, as always, Tucker, we'll we'll Thank see you, you soon. Take care. <laughs>